الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد We have a very important and inshallah uh, interesting dars today um, So inshallah I want to try to keep the speed but uh, we want to make sure everybody either takes notes or watches the video again and, and benefits from a lot of the points that are being brought because as I mentioned, there are many of the miracles of the Prophet ﷺ that we're going to cover. Many of them we've already begun. And I'm not numbering them, but I want the brothers and sisters to make notes or take notes or whatever, because this should increase our iman. I mean, this is something that should be an evidence for us about the truth of Islam, amongst many others. So we were discussing the uh, time before Rasulullah ﷺ and Qusay ibn Kilab and how he developed or built Dar al-Nadwa. Dar al-Nadwa, um, this is a place of consultation. And this is something interesting that Quraysh had. And he's the first one that built it. And across the board, Ibn Hajar يعني, and Ibn Kathir and uh, Zahabi and others have mentioned this. And it became a place of gathering. So the Quraysh would get together to make their important decisions, but they would also use it uh, a place to host weddings because houses were small. I mean, their places were very small. So they would have festivals there, they would have greetings there, but this was also the place where they would go to solve problems between sub clans and so on. And later in, in the tariq, we will see that this was used to plot against the Prophet ﷺ as well. The Quraysh, when they made the plot to kill the Prophet ﷺ, this is the place they did it. Tell you, but he built it, and we talked about that يعني, uh, Qusay uh, had a brother named Abdul Dar and Abdul Dar was the least qualified and the least able and the least respected out of his brothers so his father made him in the position of leadership because he saw his other sons were already and he respected and honored and well off so he's hoping to help him out in this way Abdul Dar's children inherited from him and one of his children, and this is subhanAllah uh, mentioned in the books of Sirah uh, across the board. And I'm going to mention a few things because sometimes you have uh, brothers and sisters, may Allah cure our hearts. They just watch the dust to try to find faults, right? And then they're like, oh, this thing you mentioned doesn't have a sanad here or whatever. And just because I don't spend like half an hour on each uh, issue explaining my takhreed doesn't mean that I don't do the takhreed, right? Here what I'm going to mention is books of Sirah mention it without Sanat, but there are a hadith sahih that prove it, including the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu that Sanat, then I will explain. But this here, this segment is mentioned in the Kutub of Tariq across the board, and there are sahih mawquf, yani from the Sahaba narrations that clearly show it to be true. Tayyib. So one of the sons of Abdul Dar, he was sitting in Dar al Nadwa, and he was drunk. SubhanAllah, this is from the disgraceful actions of a drunk that they always make bad decisions. So as he was drunk, one of the young men of Quraysh, his name was Hakim ibn Hizam. Hakim ibn Hizam radiallahu anhu. Now this is يعني, even before the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu But Hakim ibn Hizam no doubt is a Sahabi. He was from the Quraysh. He was very young at that time, but he lived a very long life. And we have a hadith reported from him. And he is one of the people that reports about this incident. And Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu also reports about him. And Hakim ibn Hizam radiyallahu anhu, like we find him in the books of uh, tabaqat of the Sahaba and the tabaqat of the Rijal in hadith and so on. We know that he lived all the way to the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu. And he lived a very long life. And he was very intelligent. He was known for being a very shrewd man. And at that time, obviously he wasn't a Muslim. Why? Because this is before the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not born at this time. Hakim ibn Hizam, um, even though he was very young, he was very intelligent, he went to Dar al-Nadwa and he sat with uh, the son of Abdul Dar. And as he was drunk, he told him, since this is now your property, why don't you sell it to me? <laughs> sell me. This place, this, it was a house that was made for such a consultation. It was very big, it was very nice. So a drunk is nothing. I mean, a drunk has no intelligence. 
So he tells him, yeah, I'll sell it to you, no problem. And he told him for how much? He said for one jug of wine, and one container of alcohol, subhanAllah. And this thing that is worth so much money, and it is so honorable, it is such a great thing, and you will see that Hakim will sell it later on, and we'll talk about this inshallah, for a hundred thousand dirham. A hundred thousand dirham. What is he selling it for? For one thing of alcohol. And subhanallah, and you see the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why khamar is haram. And some people we give da'wah to, and they tell us, like, yeah, I'm ready to become Muslim, but I can't give up drinking. I can't do this. Why, why can't Muslims drink a little bit? What, what? Look, Allah knows better than you. Why are you worried about alcohol and hijab and these furu'ah? When you know that you have a Rabb, a creator who created you, then whatever that creator ordained is best for you. Then all you have to do is aslama. You have to submit. We don't have to, why the beard? Oh, because the hair keeps you work. Why the beard? Because Rasulullah Sallallahu ordered it. Why the hijab? Because Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered it. Khalas. Who knows better? You or Allah. Right? So here we look at the hikmah. I need the benefit though. This drunk, <laughs> he tells him, okay, I will sell you this amazing, I mean, honorable, expensive place for one jug of wine. Now, Hakim Hizam was intelligent. Immediately, before, you know, they say in English, strike while the iron's hot, right? Immediately he went, he gathered some witnesses from Quraysh, he came back, he said, look, you agree to this deal? Yes. I will give you a jug of wine, you will sell Dar Madwa to me? He said, yes. He said, Khalas. Gave him the jug of wine, got it. <laughs> when he sobered up, and he was like, whoa, 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 wait, what? What happened? He said, I got witnesses, bro. <laughs> Khalas. So Hakim al Hizam now owned Dar Madwa. Now the Quraysh still used it. And he still allowed them to use it, but he was the owner of it. Thank you. Now, I mentioned this, and I'm just going to go, like I said, we're going to go uh, further in history just as it's related to this Dar Nadwa, right? And uh, in the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, in the Khilaf of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, um, Hakim ibn Hizam was very old. He was very, very old. And yani, later on, he died during that time as well. He died during the Khilaf of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. But at that time, he sold Dar Nadwa to a yani, regular person, not somebody who would make it work for Quraysh and things. He sold it, and that person bought it for a hundred thousand dirham. And yeah, hundred, you know, dinar is gold, dirham is silver, right? A hundred thousand dirham is a lot of money. So that person bought it and made it a house for himself. So it was no longer from that period onwards, it was no longer used for consultation. So Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he called the, the Sahabi, and he was a Sahabi, so he respected him, but he told him, what have you done? You sold the, the karam, or the, yani the, the honorable place of Quraysh. Yani this was a historic place the Quraysh used to meet and gather, and this was something that belonged to the Qabila of Quraysh. And you sold this uh, for yani, uh, money, like for worldly things. So, uh, uh, Hakim ibn Hizam radiallahu anhu, he responded to him, and this ibn Kathir has been bidaw and nihaya with the sanad and all of that, and this is also reported yani, by ibn Sa'ad and his tabaqat and other kutub. He said, Dahabat al makarim fala karam illa bi taqwa. SubhanAllah, beautiful thing. He said, Those things that people used to use for honor and yani, dignity and all those, those things are gone now. Those days of Quraysh saying, oh, you know, we're honored because of this place and this place, those are gone. There is no karam, there is no honor and distinction and all of that except in taqwa. SubhanAllah, very beautiful lesson. Yani, no doubt, like, there are things that are, uh, yani, places that are of historic significance, right? But unless there is a shari'i ibadah tied to it, then there is no real significance to it. Yani, when Uthman Radiyanu expanded Majlis al-Nabwi, I'm sure there were very beautiful historic sites that had to be destroyed to expand Majlis al-Nabwi. Later on, as the expansions go, with the Haram in Mecca and the Haram in Medina, there are houses of Sahaba that were destroyed to expand the Masjid. So what? Some people say, oh, what about that Salman Farisi's house and this Sahabi's house? You want to leave those houses and you want to go make Hajj in a, in a little place like this? Already it's crowded. And if it wasn't for COVID, right, when you go for the Hajj or go in the last days of Ramadan or even in Ramadan, even regularly sometimes in Umrah, it's packed. 
You got no room, and then you're cursing. There's no room, there's no room. And then you're like, oh, why did they destroy these places? They destroyed them for your convenience. What's the point of those places? La. Yani the haram in Mecca, the haram in Medina, these have to do with ibadat. So no doubt they have to uh, Al-Aqsa and places like this. But otherwise, other than this, this is where uh, Falah Sahabi sat down. That's interesting, but that's not an ibadah. Right? So here, Hakim ibn Hizam, he taught Mu'amir a beautiful lesson. But then what did he do? He took that 100,000 dirham, what did he do with it? He gave it all fi sabilillah. He took 100,000 dirham, he gave it all fi sabilillah. He told Mu'amir I didn't sell this for myself. I saw this because I realized that what is taqwa is to take this and give it fi sabilillah in the path of Allah. So people can use it yani, uh, for qital and for everything else. So that, that is where you will get the reward. Not saying, oh look, I have this place the Quraysh used to have and I, I have the... That's, that, those things of false dignity are gone. Now what matters is taqwa. Tayyip. Husay, as we mentioned, he was the most honored from amongst the children, uh, even if he was not yani, the one who was made the leader at the time. He had children, we talked about in the last dars, uh, Abdul Munaf, we talked about him. Abdul Munaf's children, they, they realized that the, from the lineage of uh, Abdul Dar, the people that were becoming the leaders of Quraysh were not the most qualified. Yes, their grandfather yani, made them uh, in charge to try to help them. But they said, Khalas, yani, whatever they were going to get from uh, Abdul Dar becoming the leader, they got those already. But now we have to look at who's more qualified and who's the best to lead. And uh, Abdul Munaf, uh, him and his children, they got together and they fought Abdul Dar's uh, children for leadership. And here, yani, the weapons were drawn, and the Arabs were quick to fight. At the time, they were quick to spill blood. But the leaders of Quraysh, here they got involved, and they said, look, why should we spill blood? I mean, this is a very foolish thing. And even in our time, we see this sometimes in Muslim countries, there is a dispute over land, or dispute over some property, or something, you know, a water, water canal. And subhanAllah, we shed the blood of the Muslim over this, amongst each other. And this is very horrible. I mean, in Islam... The innocent blood is protected. Understand this. Even a dhimmi, even somebody yani, who is under a protection, the blood cannot be spilled without reason. And especially, especially the blood of the Muslim. Rasulullah sallallahu said this is more sacred than, than the Kaaba. Right? And this is something, I mean, nowadays we see some of the groups out there very quick to shed the blood of the Muslim. Very quick to justify uh, killing innocent Muslims for whatever political gains that they have. And, and they're very quick to support things that are against the Sharia. Supporting yani, uh, acts where they go and kill a lot of Muslims and trying to kill one person and this and that. And yani, suicide bombings where, where innocent people are mostly the targets and so on. When these things are against the rules of jihad. In the Sharia, we have rules. And that's why we don't support such groups. We don't support such ideologies that break the rules of the Sharia. We have, alhamdulillah, the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave rights. We don't, this idea of quickly justifying innocent blood as collateral, collateral damage and so on, these are not things in the Sharia. And that's why we, we tell brothers you should gain knowledge. Don't talk about this group and that group and we support, don't, don't talk about these things until you have knowledge. Go and study first. And when you understand, then go and study some more to make sure that you really understand. It's not that you think you understand. And then ask the ulema about this. Who told you to go and speak? Just because you have a, a Facebook doesn't mean that you're a mufti. <laughs> the Quraysh leaders, they went and they told the, the people, they said, why are we going to shed blood amongst our own people? Instead, they sat down and they made a deal. They said, the children of the Manaf, they will get the responsibility of the Hujjaj and taking care of the Kaaba and things like this when the children of the Dar would continue to have other things of leadership. And the Arab, this is the thing they really wanted. The Quraysh, this is what they wanted was to honor the Hujjaj. They weren't really after just making money as leaders and so on. They weren't after campaign donations and things like this. They really wanted the honor of being those that host the Hujjaj. And this is what they got. And alhamdulillah, for this they were happy. Abdul Manaf, as we mentioned, 
He had uh, children, and we talked about this in the last dars, just recapping here to catch us up. And one of them being Hashim. Hashim, his name is what? Amr. But from Hashama, from breaking, comes Ism Fa'il, which is Hashim. And he would break the bread and he would make it into like a soup and, and, and make it when it was more generous and more uh, of a service for the Hujjaj and he became famous as such. We talked about his marriage uh, to uh, uh, Salama uh, from, the, from the honored people of Medina and how he died uh, in Gaza on his trade route to Sham. The people of Quraysh were businessmen. They would go out and he is the one that set up يعني, a lot of the trade of the uh, Quraysh and the Rahla fi Shita wa Saif. He is the one that set up that system of going to Yemen when it was cold and going to Sham when it was warm for these two yearly business trips for Quraysh. He is the one that set it up as it has been mentioned in the Quran as well. Tayyib, when he died, his son, uh, then his name was Shayba, يعني, Shayba, was there with his mother Salma in Medina because the father never came back to get his son. But his uncle, Abdul, uh, Abdul Muttalib, as we mentioned, يعني, Ali bin Abi Talib, uh, Talib here being, we'll talk about inshallah, Abu Talib coming afterwards. Abdul Muttalib is the grandfather of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well through, I mean, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so from here, from being the brother of Hashim. Abu Talib then went to Medina and got his nephew to come back with him. And when Talib uh, was the one that brought it, uh, Abu Talib, then he bringing Shaiba with him on the same camel, people saw this and started to call Shaiba Abdul Muttalib. Muttalib being the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa through being the, for the uh, grand uncle, through being the brother of Hashim. And now the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ, Abdul Muttalib, became famous with this title, even though يعني, his actual name is Shayba. But he became known by it, and he is the grandfather of Rasulullah ﷺ, as we see in the Kutub of Tariq. Abdul Muttalib, we mentioned him earlier because of the event that happened with him and Abraha. And there are two very significant events. One of them is this, um, but we already discussed that in detail. There is one other very significant event, and we'll talk about that today. And there is a book, Al-Lu'lu Al-Maknoon, of uh, Sheikh Al-Musa Al-Azami. Um, I really recommend this book if you can get it. And it gives you a lot of takhreej and a lot of interesting details about it. But he also mentioned this as one of the two most important events in the life of Abdul Muttalib. Tayyib. So what happened now? Abdul Muttalib being the son of Hashim the nephew of Muttalib. And now with the generations of Abdul Muttalib and them passing on the leadership to him, is now the de facto leader of the Quraysh. And with what happened with Abraha and the honor that Allah gave him by protecting him. Now, even though at this time he's a mushrik, and some of the people, they try to justify uh, yani their ghulu, yani their exaggeration, and they say, no, everybody from the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa from the grandfather all on Tawheed. But يعني, it's clearly against Sahih Ahadi. Clearly. And we'll, we'll discuss it today. Abdul Muttalib was a mushrik. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him Nusra against Abraha. Abraha, even though he, they had also developed shirk, but he was closer to Tawheed than Abdul Muttalib. But why? As Ibn Hajar and others have mentioned, because this was preparation for the final messenger, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The miracle that was shown in the defeat of Abraha and the Ababil, this was one of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if Abraha had destroyed the Kaaba, then how would the da'wah have begun? How would Hajj have been done? And so on. Right? This is to show that this place will be the place of the final messenger. Tayyib. Abdul Muttalib, he was sleeping in the Hatim, which is also called the Hijab, right? This is the place that if you go today, if you see the Kaaba, it is like a square. But originally, as you know, there was a curved end that was inside the Kaaba. And today it's outside. Why? As mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, this is when the Quraysh were rebuilding the Kaaba. 
They did not want any haram in the rebuilding of the Kaaba. SubhanAllah, think about this. The Quraysh were mushrikeen. They were people away from the religion, but they had enough of the guidance from the, the religion that was left by Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail السلام, that they still understood that you don't use haram for Baytullah. And today our masajid are built on riba. May Allah protect us. Yani, there are masajid that we know of that when they were buying the properties, they took their, their, their loans on riba. I mean, these people understand Islam less than the Quraysh before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, because they ran out of halal money, they, they could not cover that area, so they made it into a square. And that area, if you pray in it, it is as if you've prayed inside the Kaaba. And that is why the Fard Salah cannot be prayed in. Fard Salah has to be outside of it. You can only make Nafal Salawat in. We see some people trying to run in during the Fard Salah, trying to pray in it. And the, and the poor, may Allah reward them, the, the, the Islamic police there is always uh, trying to tell them, like, don't do it. <laughs> and people don't listen. But Fard Salah is not accepted inside. So, here he was sleeping in this area. And at this time, the Quraysh had rebuilt according to what is correct. So this was outside the Kaaba. And he saw a dream. And in that dream, what the ulama have said, there was a malik, an angel, who came and told him, Ahfar, يعني, to dig up a tiba. A tiba, يعني, a tayyib, what we would say, what is pure, what is appealing, what is good. So he asked the malik, يعني, ما هو يعني what is it what's طيبة and the malik the angel in the dream just walked away so he woke up and he, he realized this was a dream that had some importance now this is now part of the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu that's beginning because this has to prepare Mecca for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one of the shiuch one of my shiuch may Allah protect him Muhammad he gave a very beautiful example he said that this is like a madrasa يعني when you're building a, a place to teach knowledge and stuff, you start to lay the foundation. So what do you think? Okay, what do we need? We need water. We need, we need a place and things like this. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting the place which would become later the madrasa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the haram. Of course, water will be needed, a place. So everything is being laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now water is needed. Zamzam is there from the time of Ismail alayhi salam, but it has been covered up. Now we talked about the battles between Khuza'a and Jurham. And this, these battles, for example, these are in the Kutub of Sirah without Sanad. But these events that are mentioned in Sanad then, then prove those to be correct. So because of the, the, the time when Khuz'a defeated Jurham, and Jurham hid the Zamzam, at this time the people of Mecca did not know where Zamzam is. So when they wanted to get water, they would go outside of Mecca to wells that had been done, small wells, and those would dry up, so then they would look for new water, and it would be a very difficult thing, but they would do it for themselves, and they would go out to get water for the Hajjaj that would come from outside of Mecca. But now, and when the preparation for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for Islam, for the Hajjaj that would come after, after the Salah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no doubt Mecca had to be, re- I mean Zamzam had to be rediscovered. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this as a dream because this is the time before Nabuwa. So here dreams were the, were the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would communicate to the people. And even after Nabuwa there are dreams, but now we don't make interpretation through the ways that they did it. Now we use a Nabuwa, we use what is correct from the Quran and the Sahih Ahadith and the Ishtihad of Alama. This is what we have Yaqeen on. Right? But at that time they didn't have that. So when he woke up, he said, Who should I ask? He went to the Quraysh and he went to the leaders of Quraysh and he told them, I saw this dream. They told him that, and subhanAllah, yani what they knew, they said, if this is a true dream, you will have it again. And if it's from shaitan, then don't worry about it and let it go. And if it doesn't come again, then it was something from shaitan. So he let it go. Here, <coughs> he went to sleep at around the same time the next day. And subhanAllah, he saw the dream again. By the way, just on a side note, uh, there is a beautiful dream, a book called uh, Rawdatul Unuf Fi uh, Tafsir Sirat Ibn Hisham. And it explains some of the words here. So it says, why, why did the Malaika 
call it Tayba, and this is because of uh, Ismail alayhi salam being Tayyib and Ibrahim alayhi salam and so on. And through every word that was used in this narration, they explain it. Very interesting book. Tayyib. So here, when the dream came again, the Malik, the angel, he told him, Ahfar, and he dig up Barra. Barra ta, yani, that which is blessed. Barra, like Abra, Bir, all comes from the same root word as uh, 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 Suhaili. He has mentioned in his uh, tafsir of the book of Sirah. Very interesting. So here, the Malik, the angel used a different word. Malik, yani, it's from Malaika. He used a different word, but he was still describing a zamzam. But he didn't explain the word again. Here, uh, Abdul Muttalib, he tells him, ma huwa barra, yani, what is it? And the Malik, he, he walks away without explaining. So now, he continues to have this dream a third night. And this time, he's told, Uhfar al madnuma And what madnuna? what is that? As Suhaili, he explained, this is that which is desired, that which is love, that which is yani, sought after. Something where you have bukhul for it, like you really want it. In the end, the fourth night, he has a dream where the Malik told him, Uhfur Zamzam. Now here, so much time has passed that people have forgot what Zamzam is. So he tells them, what is Zamzam? What is Zamzam? Then the Malik tells him, Zamzam is that and I'm going to summarize from the longer narrations here. He says that which the, it never rots, it doesn't go bad. That which never runs out. That which is always abundant. That which is always pure. That is be, which is between the ant hills and where the crows will peck. And we'll explain that in a minute. But here we realize the fadail of zamzam. The virtues of zamzam. And I'll mention a few narrations here just for us to understand. Because it's related to the dars here. And of course, entire booklets have been written on the virtues of Zamzam. I'm not going to go deep into it. But the hadith that is mentioned in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, uh, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, إِنَّهَا مُبَارَكَةً It is something mubarak, it is something that is blessed. And إِنَّهَا تَعَامُ تُمْعٍ It is a food that satisfies. In the uh, addition that Abu Dawud al-Tilasi has mentioned, it is a shifa that cures as well. Now this narration in its asal is in Sahih Muslim, no doubt to its authenticity. But if we go deeper, we find other narrations that mention the ma of zamzam, yani it is lima shariba lahu, yani whatever it is drank for. This narration I mentioned in the earlier durus, and then somebody tried, oh it's da'if in this. Look, just because you googled it, doesn't mean that you know about the narration. Look deeper, and if you're gonna ask, then look deeper. It has some da'af in its sanad. But no doubt it is hasan li ghayri. It is reliable. As Ibn Muflih has mentioned, as Ibn Hajar has mentioned, as Zarkashi has mentioned, as Ibn Al-Qayyim has mentioned, as Suyuti has mentioned, as Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin in Irwa al ghalil In other places he mentioned the weakness of it, and I'm just going deeper here to and he wake up some of the people with the diseases in their hearts. Sheikh Albani, because he made da'af on it in some books, they just find that and they get all happy. Ah, I got it, I got you. Continue your reading first. Look at Irwal Ghali. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen in Sharh al Mumti in the seventh volume in page number 378, you will find as well. No doubt it's a reliable narration. And I can find you many other asanid and many other that mention from Jabir radiallahu anhu and from Abdullah ibn Mubarak later and so on. It's a reliable narration. Don't worry about it. What does it tell you that it is for whatever you drink it for? Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, in the authentic narration, he went to Mecca and for a month he wasn't eating anything. He was just drinking zamzam. People told him, who's feeding you? Where are you eating from? He said, I'm not drinking anything. I'm not eating anything except zamzam. And he showed that he had gained weight. He had gained weight just drinking zamzam. Zamzam is that blessed thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. Subhanallah. When we look at Zamzam, the last or the second last of what the, mal the Malik in the dream told uh, Abdul Muttalib about, that it is that which is people want, people have a great desire for. There is a hadith of Rasulullah 
that in the ayah it is an evidence ma baynana wa bayn al munafiqin what is between us and the munafiqin is our love our hirs to drink them this narration also yani there are some ulama that criticize it like sheikh al bani and rawal ghalil but it is also authentic because of supporting evidences as sheikh ibn uthaymin has mentioned again in sharh al mumti' Seventh volume, page number 379, he gives a beautiful takhreed. Abbay Suri also said, Isnaduhu Sahih, Urjaluhu Thaqat, it is authentic. Imam al Bukhari in Tariq al Sagheer, on page number 193, is also authenticated it. Abu Naim has also accepted it. Al Bayhaqi and Darqutni also accepted it. So, again, a reliable narration. What does the Prophet tell him that this is a sign between us and the hypocrites? The hypocrites, they don't have a thirst for Zamzam. The taste of zamzam is not sweet. Some brothers over exaggerate. It's so sweet. It's not. We know it's not sweet. We drink it. But we still love it. Not because it's the sweetest water in the world. Why? Because of the barakah in it. Because this is the water that Rasulullah has given us an encouragement to drink. Because this water is from a well that was a sign of Ismail alayhi salam. And it was a sign about the nabuwa of the Prophet ﷺ, as we see here. And it is something where Rasulullah ﷺ loved it and drank it. And that's why we love it. And that's why the mu'min will love to drink it. And the munafiq, even if he goes for Hajj Umrah, he's like, yeah, it's alright. Yeah, I drank it, it's alright. <laughs> and this is, it shows. And that's why the believer, he sticks to it. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. This is a sign between us and the munafiqun. Tayyib. A little bit about Zamzam. Uh, and inshallah I'm going to discuss a little bit more, but I'm going to just mention this here. A lot of people, because of the weakness of Iman, I mean, they always ask, so what's special about Zamzam? So I want to be clear, what's special about Zamzam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it special. That's it. That's it. But there are many scientific research uh, papers that have been published that are also very interesting. They're interesting. They're not the reason why Zamzam is special, but it is interesting to see some of the hikmah. Um, there is a peer-reviewed publication, uh, and I'll give the base of the, uh, the URL. You can look it up yourself. Uh, ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And this is a collaboration of many different institutes of health around the world that is governed by a government body and peer-reviewed research that is put. And there is a research paper written by uh, Dr. Hani Salah and Rehab Talhawi and Suleiman Amir. Um, and interestingly, they present a study where they used actual uh, plates and research. And, uh, and they found that Zamzam water would take zero pathogens. It would not take pathogens. And this is something that they've done a proper research study that has been peer reviewed. And this is something that we found in the hadith about. Abdul Muttalib's dream. And Ali bin Abi Talib radiyanu, in a Sahih Sanad talked about this. Right. So now we find that this is a water that doesn't rot. Having said that, I want also brothers and sisters to be careful in some of the bottled Zamzam that is commercially sold. If you know, the government of Saudi does not allow Zamzam to be exported for resale. So most of these stores that are selling these little plastic bottles with Zamzam, most of them are fake. They are not real. Because the government of Saudi does not allow Zamzam to be exported for resale. If you go and take Zamzam for yourself, Alhamdulillah. But be very careful because sometimes these things are sitting and expiration dates are gone. And they're like, it's Zamzam, it doesn't go bad. But it's not Zamzam. And you can get sick from it. So be careful about what you buy and where you get it. Best thing to get the Zamzam there, and especially if you go, may Allah bless us all, on Hajj and Umrah, and you go to the Haram, and you drink the Zamzam there, make sure you benefit from it. Drink it as much as you can. As Suyuti, he said, I went and I drank Zamzam, and I made dua that, oh Allah, open up the uloom of Islam for me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really, if you look at Suyuti, and look at a lot of his works, and Mustalal hadith and uloom al-Quran, it's amazing. Right? Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he said, I went and I drank Zamzam with the niyyah that, oh Allah, protect me from the hardships of the day of judgment. Mm-hmm. Many of the Sahaba, Ibn Abbas, عن, he drank it, he said, oh Allah, make, give me the beneficial knowledge. But be careful, يعني, don't, don't play with it. And don't be there, oh Allah, make me fly. <laughs> it's not something to play with. Right? You go make dua for that which benefits you. 
Khair Zamzam is now hidden there, and the Malik, the angel, tells Abdul Muttalib that go and look for it between the ant hills and a place that a crow will peck. Now there are some different narrations, and I'm going to bring them together here. And as I mentioned, they're mentioned from Ali ibn Abi Talib as well. So here, there are there is one of the narrations it mentioned that this will be in the place where a, a animal is sacrificed and the blood drips. Okay? At that time, the Quraysh used to sacrifice animals for idols. And this is shirk. And this is shirk. They were mushrikeen. And unfortunately, this goes on in our ummah today. In our ummah. May Allah protect us. Maybe not for idols, but for what they call baba. And you are saint, or peer, or this, or that, awliya. They go and they say, I'm going to sacrifice this black goat for peer baba. And instead of for Allah. And it's the same shirk. <laughs> Uh, and, and I don't know why it's got to be a black goat. <laughs> and a black chicken. And you got to get a black rooster. And you got to sacrifice it for this awliya. Why not give it sadaqah for Allah? To sacrifice an animal for other than Allah is shirk. It's kufr. Takes you outside the fold of Islam. And it still goes on in our ummah. May Allah protect us. Tayyib. So the, the mushrikeen used to sacrifice animals. He said the place where they sacrifice and where the blood drips between that. And then he specified again. He said this is the place where you will see the ant hills and you will see a crow. In one of the narrations, the crow will have white wings. Right? So it's a special crow. And where it pecks, between there you go and you will find it. Abdul Muttalib, this is his fourth dream. Right? Four nights in a row. So he realizes this is true. Now he doesn't tell anybody. He doesn't tell the rest of the Quraysh about this last one. Right? He goes and he doesn't have kids that are old enough to help except one son, al Harith. Right? Abdul Muttalib, as some of the ulema of tarikh, mentioned that he had 10 children, six boys and four girls. Other ulema, and what seems to be more correct, is that he had 10 sons. Right? Not just 10 children, but 10 sons. And we'll talk about them and their names, inshallah, today in the dars. Inshallah. But the eldest of them is al Harith, And Harith was the only one old enough to go and help his father. So he told al Harith, let's go. Hey, Harith didn't ask his father, where are we going? What are we doing? Why are we going? This is Khalif al adab This is against the etiquette of a son with a father. To ask why. He went. Abdul Muttalib took Harith and he started to go dig where he was shown. And he saw that a man went and killed a cow and he sacrificed it for two of the idols. And this is Isaf and Naila. Isaf and Naila, we talked about them earlier in the Duru's. These were two people of zina. A man and a woman that were doing zina and Allah cursed them and made them into stone. And this is before Rasulullah sallallahu obviously. And the people started worshipping people of zina. <laughs> Subhanallah. Sometimes when you see the people of shirk, it kind of makes you want to laugh and cry at the same time. In our land, and I won't mention the country by name, there, there are some quote-unquote awliya. I mean, they call them awliya, peer babas, right? One of them that was well known in the people from that country, they will know what I'm talking about, and you can ask them. He was known as the naked, naked one. <laughs> Grown man walks around like naked, naked, and they're like, He's not crazy, he's awliya. <laughs> he's not a flash or a perv, he's out. SubhanAllah. How do you know awliya? They're the ones that stick to the sunnah the most. They will be the harshest to be upon the haq, upon the Quran or sunnah. A man who doesn't cover his aura, how can he be from awliya? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa even before nabuwa, Allah protected him that his aura was never exposed. Can you imagine sahaba walking around with aura exposed? And they are the best of the awliya of this ummah. How can you be so ignorant? And people take na'udhu like their wives and children. Do dumb on them. Ruqi on them. <laughs> what ruqi has a naked guy going to do? No, we the people of sunnah have to address these things. We have to show these bid'at. We have to speak against these things. No matter what they title us. So these people of zina <laughs> became na'udhu billah. Uh, gods for them and so this man went and he's sacrificing a cow for these idols 
And as he drops the animal and the blood flows, Abdul Muttalib sees the place, he sees the ant hills, he sees the crow, he finds the place and he's digging. And as he's digging, he thinks to himself that if Allah blesses me with 10 sons and one of the narrations 10 children, what is correct 10 sons, then I will sacrifice one for Allah. Now here he knew the word Allah. It's not that he didn't know the word Allah, but he still did shirk. And we'll talk about that inshallah. So don't, and some of the people of the weak iman, when they get a little carried away with their inner faith and unity in this, yes, we want to be united, but we want to be united upon what? Al-Kitab wa sun We unite upon what? Huh? I think some of the brothers are weakening here. What happened here? We unite upon what? Kitab wa sun we don't unite upon sacrificing our principles. We don't unite upon bid'ah. We don't unite upon turning the other eye. We don't unite upon sacrificing our principles. Our unity is going to be upon what? Kitab wa sunnah. That's it. So, when you see somebody just mention the name Allah, it doesn't make them Muslim. And sometimes you get the rafid of the filth. You get the, the mushrikeen worshipping qubur. You get the people who, who are today, uh, people who go and lock arms with lesbians and things like this. And people say, we have to unite. Why? They said Allah too. <laughs> Just because you said the name Allah doesn't make you a Muslim. There are qawaid and shurud. Otherwise, Abdul Muttalib said the word Allah. The Quraysh said, they knew Allah. Tayyib. So, he said, I will sacrifice one son. And now this is something against Islam. And in the Sharia, we don't sacrifice children uh, like this. In the Sharia, we have rules and regulations. But he didn't know the rules and regulations at the time because this is before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Tayyip, now he started to dig and the Quraysh, they see him digging in the place where their idols are. Right? This is the place of their idols. So they got upset. They got upset here and they told him, what are you doing? You're digging up this place, it's going to hurt our idols. And SubhanAllah, and he, the idols can't defend themselves. But, right? Abdul Muttalib knew that his dream was from Allah. So he, at this time, even though he used to worship idols himself, but at this time, he wasn't concerned, he was digging. And he told his son Harith, he says, and he argue with them, keep them busy so I can continue. His son Harith obeyed his father. He went and he started arguing with them and delaying them and keeping them busy while his father was digging. As he dug, he found where the beginning of the well of Zamzam was. Now here the Quraysh, they also saw this and then they remembered what he had seen in his dream. So now they realized that he had found water. And of course, in the desert, in places like this, you want water. So now the Quraysh is now no longer stopping him. Who cares about the idols now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let them get it. We want the water. Right? So he continued. And there is a lot of yani, uh, discussion about this. But now he found Zamzam. And this Zamzam, of course, is, this is something very valuable. Not just because it's water, this is a blessed water. I mean, I can tell you that there was a sister in San Diego, a revert sister that was diagnosed with cancer. And herself, she went, she drank Zamzam, she went for Hajj, her, her cancer receded. I know a brother myself that was injured and he had an injury on his foot that, that the doctors had told him uh, and in another country, the doctors had told him you have to amputate your foot. He went with a pure niyyah, with tawakkul, with dependence on Allah, not with doubt, not with this yani, weirdness that we have, not to go test Allah, na'udhu billah. But he went with that niyyah, he went and dragged Zamzam, his, pure, his, his foot was cured. The doctors, Muslim doctors, they were shocked. And there are many yani, people that we know and this is no doubt a true thing. And, and again, research papers have been put upon this about the alkaline levels in the water, that they're high, and calcium and so on. But I'm not going to get into all of that. Here now, he found Zamzam. There are some narrations that mention that he also found some gold and swords. Ibn Sa'ad has that in his tabaqat. Those narrations are da'if. But the fact that he found Zamzam, these are sahih narrations. Okay? So... But there are, again, he was the first one to put gold on the door of the Kaaba, so they strengthened the weaker narrations as well. Tayyib. When he found Zamzam, he had made his niyyah now that he will sacrifice his son. But the first issue now got to be who owns this water. Abdul Muttalib said, look, I'm the one that found it. It's on nobody's land. It is mine. 
The Quraysh said, no, 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 this, we're going to all get rights to this water. Right? So they got into this argument. They said, how will we solve this issue? They said, we'll go to Al-Kahim, a magician. Now this shows you that Abdul Muttalib was a mushrik. And I need to go to a magician for this, this is shirk. So all those people that go into Gulu and no, no, he was a Muslim and even some ulama that wrote books trying to, this is an exaggeration. He was a mushrik. So they said, we'll go to Akahi. And this is mentioned authentic narrations in the Kathir al Dhabi has this across the board. Where was the best Kahim they could find? He was in Sham. Outside the areas of Dimashq and things today. That was not developed as it is today. But this was an area of Sham. So they decided to go on this trip. And on the way, they were going through the desert. Right? Now, it's not like today where you have freeways and you have signs and things. You go through deserts, and if your water runs out, you die. Because you can't make it back, and you can't make it to your place. So they always try to take enough water, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as was meant to be, He made it that they ran out of water. Now at this time, Abdul Muttalib and his people and the other leaders of Quraysh and representatives are all going and everybody has their own water. The first to run out was Abdul Muttalib. And there's a very interesting note Ibn Kathir has in Bidayah Niha, which I'll mention at the end of this. So Abdul Muttalib, now that he's out of water, he tells the other leaders, share your water. The others, they tell him, if we share your water, then we're all going to die. I don't think we're even going to make it. So now, they said, what should we do? Abdul Muttalib, he was an Arab, and he was from the Quraysh, and he, people of honor. So he said, it's, it's disrespectful that our bodies are going to be laying here, and crows and vultures are going to be eating our bodies. So let's do this, let's dig our own graves, and let's lay in them. And each one that dies, the ones that are alive, bury, until one will be left in the end, and khalas, he will be the one that will be eaten by crows and things, by vultures. But the rest will at least die an honorable death of being buried. And their mindset was interesting. They were very honor-based, right? So they dug graves and they were laying there waiting to die. But now if he had died, what would happen? Rasulullah would not be born. He's the grandfather of the Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now inspired him to get up and go search. Don't just sit there and die. Don't give up. Search. I mean, sitting there waiting for death is nothing honorable. Suicide is nothing honorable. Right? Honor is to strive and struggle until you become shuhada, until Allah gives you shahada, right? So he got up and he started to get on his camel to look for water. When his camel stepped, Allah brought water there. Where there was no water. This is a miracle. And this is a miracle of who? Of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because this was not for Abdul Muttalib. He's a mushrik. But he had to be saved with this miracle to show the miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here, when his camel stepped, water came out, and Abdul Muttalib, he, him and his people drank, and he shared it. He wasn't like, oh, you all didn't give me water. Go ahead and start now. Nah. And he was a man of honor. Sometimes people are very tit for tat. They didn't do this, they didn't. No, your honor should be about you. Not about what others do. You should carry yourself honor. So here, he shared the water. The rest of Quraysh, when they saw this miracle, they said, we don't need to go to that kahin anymore. You know, you are right, let's go back to Mecca. They went back to Mecca, and they said, okay, how should we do this? Unfortunately, they were still mushrikeen. So they started to use arrows, and there's something that's mentioned in the Quran about the Quraysh, and how they used to use arrows. They would have arrows with like writing, one would say, na'am or na'la, like don't do this, and then, you know, the magician would throw the arrows, and whatever came out, they would, and this is all shirk, this is kufr. Even in our ummah, when people go to read their palms, this is shirk, this is kufr. Even if you go for entertainment, 40 days your salah is not accepted. And this is something we cannot be bend on. Khair, they went back and they threw arrows about what was there. And two arrows came out. They, they, they said either they will come out for the Quraysh, or for the Kaaba, or for Abdul Muttalib. Two came out for the Kaaba, two for Abdul Muttalib. The rest of Quraysh got nothing. Abdul Muttalib... From the narrations that are weak, that he found gold, they are strengthened by the narration that mentioned that he took what he found and he put gold on the door of the Kaaba. And he was the first one to put gold on the door of the Kaaba. See? Many Sahaba mentioned that he was the first one to do this. And from the others, he made the water for himself, but he was generous, he shared it with the Quraysh, but he said, the rights are for me. But now comes a problem. He has to... Sacrifice a son. 
From his children, the ulama of tarikh have mentioned that the oldest was al harith And we find this across the board from the ulama of tarikh al harith Then he had Abbas, and I'm not going in, in chronological order, I'm just going to mention the rest of the children, right? He had Abbas and Hamza. These two will end up becoming Muslim. We know Abbas and Hamza, radiallahu anhuma, they are the uncles of the Prophet sallallahu and they are no doubt the Muslims and from the best of Muslims and from the great yani, level of Sahaba. Then they have Abdul Uzza, who is definitely a Kafir. Who is Abdul, Abdul Uzza? Abdul Lahab. Then you have uh, yani, Al Zubair and uh, Al Muqawwam, uh, who's, actual, who's also known as Abdul Kaaba. Then you have uh, Abdul Munaf, another Abdul Munaf. Then you have Dirar, which is a very interesting name to give to a child. But then you have uh, Hajla, and then you have the youngest of them, Abdullah. The youngest is Abdullah from the ten sons. Then you have Atika, then you have Arawa, then you have Safiya, then you have uh, Umayqa, then you have Barra, and then Um Hakim uh, al Bayda, and that is the daughters of Abdul uh, Muttalib and the aunts of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there are others to Rida and so on. Tayyib, now he has to fulfill his oath. He has to fulfill his oath. So he tells his children, it's very interesting, and I'm going to go over time here for a reason. He tells his children, write down your names and I'm going to pick one to kill. Okay? Now he has taken an oath. And this is, and in the Sharia, this is not allowed. In Islam, this is not allowed. Right? You cannot take an oath and kill your child. It's haram. Life is protected in the Sharia. But this is before Islam. But I want you to pay attention to the honor that these children give to their father. The father tells them, and they're grown, and most of them are grown. Abdullah is the youngest, but even he is old enough to say, what are you doing? Harith is a grown man, he has children of his own at this time, and others as well. He tells them, write down your name, I took an oath, I'm going to kill one of you. They all write down their names, they're not like, let me write my brother's name. <laughs> and then they all write down their names, they're okay. You're our father, and if you took that oath, fulfill your oath. Now this is in haram, but think back at what was in halal. Ibrahim السلام, when he told Ismail السلام, his vision, what did Ismail السلام, say? He didn't tell him, Dad, you've, you've gone nuts. <laughs> no, he said, if Allah revealed that to you to kill me, do it. You will find me patient, obedient. So here, he takes these names, and whose name comes up? Abdullah. And Abdullah is the father of who? Rasulullah. So now if Abdullah is, now look at this. Yani if Abdul Muttalib had died there, then Rasulullah would never have been born. Miraculously, Allah protected him. Here, Abdullah's name comes up. If Abdullah is killed here, then Rasulullah would not be born. So his name comes up, and he says, okay, then I'm going to do it. So he took Abdullah to where Isaf and Na'ila were, with a sword to kill him. And Abdullah willingly is now going with his father. And this again shows Abdul Muttalib was a mushrik. And he's going to two statues to kill his son there. As he's going, the other people of Quraysh, they go to stop him. They tell him, what are you doing? If you kill him, then this will make a trend. And then everybody who has 10 sons will sacrifice one, trying to compete in honor, and they'll think of this, and then we're going to be sacrificing our kids. So don't do it. Because in competition, <laughs> we can't let you outdo us. Right? And his own cousins and uncles, they went and tried to stop him. But he went and he swung his sword at Abdullah, and he hit Abdullah on the head. And Abdullah became injured, his blood flew, but he lived. And the people, they stopped him. So he said, what should we do then? He said, let's go to the Kahin and figure out what to do. They went to magicians because they didn't have ulama. We should go to ulama, the people who will tell us what is right in the light of Quran, with Sahih Ahadith. But at that time, this was their shirk. So they went to a famous Kahin in Medina. When they went there, they said, he's right now in Khaybar. They went to Khaybar, the Kahin said, my jinn is not here today. Sorry. <laughs> he said, the jinn's day off. But subhanAllah, this shows what they used, they used to deal with jinn. He didn't just make it up. These were real mushrikeen. So he said, come back tomorrow, my jinn will be here. So they, they waited there. When they went back, the jinn told them that what they should do is give in blood money Yani, what would be given for somebody that was killed instead of killing? But you have to draw arrows 
to do it. It is all shirk. So they told him, what is the tradition in Mecca? He said, 10 camels. So said, okay, 10 camels, draw arrows. If the arrow comes to paying the uh, blood money, then sacrifice 10 camels. And if it comes from Abdullah, then you have to kill him. But if you do it once, you can do it again, but then you'll have to give 10 camels each time. Okay. So he drew the camel, the, the arrows, it came to killing Abdullah. So because he loved Abdullah so much, he said, I will do it again. Nine times he did it, it came to Abdullah. So now how many camels does he have to give? 90. The tenth time he did it, it came to Abdullah. To save Abdullah. Came to the camels, yani in favor of Abdullah. The tenth time, but now, he didn't want to be a hypocrite. And he was a man of his word. He said, no, no, do it again. And he did it three more times. And every time it came to the camels, saving Abdullah. That means that he did not have to give for each one of those times because in the favor of Abdullah. Tayyip. So now it came all together. They said, just make it 100. He said, no, I will make it 200. And I don't want to trick even with... Uh, any with uh, a false deity. Today we try to play tricks with Allah. I'll give zakat to myself. <laughs> so now he sacrifices 200 camels and Abdullah is saved. And now we get to the marriage of Abdullah to the mother of Rasulullah, which we'll discuss in the next stars, inshallah.